Why are we around? Hello, next talk's about to start and it's from our own Ian Ferguson. That's the kind of introduction I like, make sure people can point. You thought you were getting your lunch in around about 10 minutes time and then you let me start talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <coughs> I would like to talk about various things today. What do academic security researchers actually do? Interesting question. With some interesting remarks on the digital forensic analysis of pirate screening media IPTV on peer-to-peer -peer embedded devices. I'm going for the record of the longest talk type of here. Um, it's me, Ian Ferguson, I'm Alan McLeod. Uh, he doesn't know anything about this, he hasn't seen these slides, but he was instrumental in doing the work we're going to talk about, so he deserves a credit. <laughs> I was going to thank the Securite Committee for inviting me to give a talk on our kind of second choice emergency reserve. <laughs> Fine, okay. Um, last year I came along and tried to do the, much the same kind of thing, do the entertaining thing, the fairly lightweight talk. And I said some things about what I thought the, the future of digital forensics might hold. And the talk was, thank you very much, reasonably well uh, received. And I thought, well, maybe I should try and get this published properly. So I wrote it up, sent it off to a journal. Um, this is the worst kind of uh, hypothetical drivel we have ever seen. Please do not darken our door with this stuff ever again. So um, maybe that wasn't the right kind of talk. So I thought this year um, we'd try something like this. Thoughts on the use of hacking tools and techniques in the service of digital forensics, so some passing remarks on that. Um, an example of academic security research. What do I actually spend my time doing when I'm not standing in front of students? Would you believe I do actually get a little bit of time, not anywhere near enough when I'm standing in front of them? Um, maybe to even provoke some discussion, if we can. Uh, whether we teach new ethical hacking digital forensic people the right thing, and how do we teach them? So that's the kind of outline of the talk. Now, once upon a time, when I was a young lecturer, a very much older and wiser lecturer came along and said to me, if you're giving a talk on the spur of the moment, um, <laughs> try, and, try and be interesting. If you can't be interesting, be relevant. And if you can't be relevant, be brief. So I'm going for the brief option. So, um, what do we do? Well, we do a lot of teaching. What do academic security researchers do? I hope we do blue sky research. We do something slightly different to new security research. We're not necessarily spending our time trying to break into things. We're spending our time thinking about new ways to do things. And break things. Um, what does this academic security researcher do? Play. Um, great believer in playing great believe in getting my hands dirty with a compiler, with soldering iron, and just playing around with stuff and seeing does it spark any new ideas. But, um, second thing, when I'm invited to give a talk by a bunch of students, I reckon I've got some kind of license. It's not like I'm here on official university business, so I reckon I can do a bit of spouting forth. Um, some thoughts on, yes, right. Uh, some quotes that I've heard from various people over the years in my career as a lecturer. I really don't like programming stroke software engineering. Oh yes, there's some guilty faces. Everybody's looking at this. Uh, second thing, why do we have to learn X? Well, X is usually HTML, the web, uh, client-side scripting. Um, why do we have to learn rapids, anything that isn't hacking? I've heard that one a couple of times. Um, have you marked it yet? Usually asked 15 minutes after the deadline for hand-in has expired. Um, students who think there's a grand... Oh, I was heartened to hear Rory early on say that he's gone out into industry and suddenly realised, hey, there's a whole lot of stuff I've done. Uh, one of the things we might illustrate with a bit of this talk. Uh, I was the same. I went out, I thought I was God's gift to computer science when I was a new graduate. It didn't take me very long to realise that. Uh, students think that it means that you lot are the reasons the academics are here. Like, hardly. Um, why am I raising this? Well, I hope this will become clear as we motor through the rest of this talk. Just a little bit of background. Some of you know me well, some of you don't. Um, first of all, I am a complete fraud here. I am not a hacker. Okay? If 
you want to find out about me, go onto the internet, use my hacker tag of Ian Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will find all you need. Um, I don't have the hacker mentality, I've never had it, I wish I did, but I don't have the ability, perhaps the desire to stick my nose in where it's not wrong. I think it's one of the great things about penetration testers that you guys do have that can I get in here kind of attitude, doesn't it? What I do have is that similar kind of desire to understand how things, how systems, how nature works. I think that's what makes me a scientist. Um, my background, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a software engineer, stroke physicist once upon a time. Um, I've done some stuff with embedded systems out in industry, robotic micro manipulators, whatever they may be. I've played around with medical instrumentation. I think I have a misfortune, I have a transplant operation in this country. There's a good chance that your tissue type will be checked by some software that I'm not um, I also want to be an NFL Salafine. You didn't know they had carp coming out of the chimneys and so <laughs> It's all the mutations that they get. Um, so there, what, what am I? I'm a, I'm a numerate programmer. If you like. That's what I can find. I know a little bit about distributed systems, a little bit about mobile systems, and over the past 10 years or so, a little bit about so, enough introduction stuff, you want to lunch. picture the scene. One moment, I'm not in front of the class, sitting in the office, minding our own business with our own opposite desk. The phone rings. Hello, University of Amity, Security Department, etc, etc, etc. Voice on the other end. Can you have a TV station off the air for me? Well, that's not the kind of request I get every day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we thought a little bit about this. We thought we'd better, we'd better ring them back and see what this was about. Um, we've been approached by a, a company, who basically, they're, effectively, they're subcontractors of people like Sky. They're not the direct subcontractor of Sky, but somewhere down the chain. And their business is um, digital rights management, uh, IP protection. They basically they try and stop when TV stations are being pirated. They try and stop it. So Sky suffers all kinds of things. Their subscription TV services, football, etc., gets pirated horribly around the world for Premier League. Can we do anything about it? And it turned out that this company that we were dealing with had been notified of something that was going on in India. And in India, you could go to the local electronic centre and you can buy a set-top box which looks a lot like that one. In fact, it looks exactly like that one because it is that one. Um, and you pay about 30, the equivalent of 30 US dollars for it. Plug it into your TV, plug it into your router, plug it into your internet, and hey presto, you've got thousands and thousands of channels of digital IP TV. Most of which are completely legitimate, no problem whatsoever. Some of which have been received from Sky and rebroadcast over the internet, completely not to illegal. Now, are the people who sell the box committing any crime here? Probably not. They're just selling a means of distributing IPTV. Are the people who receive this stuff committing any crime? Consuming people stuff. Somebody somewhere is putting, is injecting pirate TV into the network that uh, this box does. So somebody's making a lot of money out. We couldn't quite figure out the uh, who was making the money out of it. We think it's basically the hardware selling the problem, making lots of money by selling these things. But this company in Dundee said, well, can you stop them doing this? Can you we can identify <coughs> that TV channel there now is broadcasting something they shouldn't. It belongs to Sky TV, it's being pirated. Can you hack them and knock them off the air? Well, interesting challenge, can you? Um, so we sat and thought about it for a while. Um, oh, just, just out of interest, uh, we haven't obviously been 100% successful. I went and checked, apparently you can buy them on Amazon, these things. This was taken this morning, um, except it's now $249 instead of $30 in an Indian market. So if you really want one, you can go buy it. Um, so we ended up with a project which was something like the forensics examination 
of pirate TV distributed by digital streaming media on a set-top <coughs> a hell of a thing to try and pronounce, I do apologize. Um, how are we going to approach this? Our first thought was, well, let's, let's reverse engineer the hardware. So we got ourselves one of these boxes, opened it up, green circuit board, one big black chip, no letters on it. No, don't fancy reverse engineering from that kind of state of absolutely nil knowledge about hardware. Second option, what we'll do, we'll plug it in, we'll wire shark it, and see if we can figure out what's going on. I'm sure you guys all played around with wire shark and all the rest of it. If you have got a computer connected to the internet and you want to be able to see the traffic, what's the first thing you need to know about how you're going to hook this thing up? What device would you use? be able to wire shock it. I'm looking for a choice of switch, router, or hub. Hub. Good idea. Why would you use a hub? Well, a dumb device. You wouldn't use a switch because otherwise we spent the first 15 minutes with an accidentally plugged into a switch wondering why we weren't seeing much traffic. But you know, everybody does it. So the idea is we're going to look at the network traffic, turn this thing on, and see what it does, see if we can figure out how it actually works. Well, it turns out that the, uh, the overall architecture of it turned out to be reasonably simple. Turn the thing on, and the first thing we saw was HTML flying all over the place. Right, let's read the HTML, let's have a look at the source, let's see what's going on. Uh, and it turns out that what it was doing was receiving uh, a channel guide, a program guide, a list of what was available on this network, uh, using HTML and JSON via a fairly standard website. So there's an embedded web server inside this set-top box. There's an embedded web client inside the set-top box, and it's talking back to a mothership. So relatively easy to see straight on. Then we thought about, right, okay, we can see the programs that come up there. List of channels, list of programs, quite interesting. All in Indian, didn't understand a word of it. Um, what about the actual video streams that come along with this thing? Can we see where they're coming from? Is it possible that we could identify a particular server this stuff was coming from and then shutting it down? We'll come on how you shut down the server in a minute, but I'm sure you've got some good ideas. Um, it turns out, of course, the set of servers which are distributing this was changing second by second. Bits of the video were coming from one place and then 20 seconds later, some of it was coming from somewhere else. And of course, we figured out very rapidly what's going on here. It's, it's a peer to peer system, it's a peer to peer architecture for distributing the video. So, yeah, sure enough, you get bits from that client, sorry, bits from that server, bits from that server. Probably not right to use the word server in the context of a peer to peer system, but there we go. Those servers were in India, the US, Germany, China, probably a few other places besides. And we figured out fairly quickly we wouldn't be peer to peer. So, of course, the folks who come to us were very interested in what they insisted on calling counterdiction, which I think means stopping, but counterdiction. Um, turned out to be very easy, actually. There's one single server where the program guide is coming from. All right, why don't you take out an injunction against the people who are producing this stuff from there, shut down their central program server, game over, which is exactly what they did. Well, the obvious thing that they would do is switch to a different server for their channel guide. But unfortunately they made a bit of a mistake. That the that was actually hardwired into the firmware of this device. But not only that, the we were using the same server to upgrade the firmware of the device. So if you take that server offline, they then can't update any of their boxes, game over, network, off. The fact that that would have taken all of the legitimate channels as well, hey, that's not our problem. All we did was give you the technical means to, to go and do this. Um, I'm sure as ethical hackers and pen testers, you can dream up with a thousand other means by which that server could have been taken down. Um, we're not into that game, so I'm not really a hacker. We merely said, look, you've got a legal case against these folks that are here, they're distributing pirate material, get a court injunction, get their server shut down, shut down. Oh. 
game really old one. They can't update the boxes. Somewhere in India, there are thousands of people with set-top boxes which no longer work because they can't get their information from the server. How do we do that? So let's just go over a little bit to, you know, are we teaching you guys the right kind of thing? We did it by applying some kind of knowledge. What did we need to know about? We need to know about networking. Good, not sure about networking. We need to know about distributed systems design. We teach you what, how to design a distributed system? It's really sure what we do. Um, you need to understand the likely software architecture. How do we figure out how this worked? Well, we sat down and said, well, if I was writing a system like this, well, I would do it so it looked like this. And sure enough, our first guess at how it might have been written wasn't too far wide of the mark. So actually having some profound, it sounds self-glorification, having some knowledge of how software is written and how large services are architected helped us in the examination exchange. We need to know about HTML, JSON, and web technologies. Is that my favourite bit of computer science? No, it's not. But, you know, hey, you've got to learn about these things. When we teach you about things and you go to the classes that you don't really like, actually, there is a reason why we think you might need to know about it one day. So it's not about knowing a particular technology. I'm not suggesting that you really, really, really ought to be taught JSON and HTML. What I'm suggesting is that we should be teaching you how to learn these technologies so that when you do come about them out in the field, then you stand a chance of being able to cope or possibly even inventing these technologies. So, do the people who make that set-top box like us or hate us? The answer is they love us because they've now got to be able to sell a whole new 50 million of these set-top boxes in India to replace the ones that we've just bought. You know, we're their heroes, right? <laughs> and sure enough, there are new versions of this kicking out there. Um, just before I was introduced here, Gavin said, you realise everybody's just come in here to, to, to laugh at your accent while you're giving me a talk. I'm, I'm considering actually defaulting back to Geordie and giving the rest of the lecture in Geordie. Now, one of the things in Geordie you know, is that it, You've got a global stop in the well, you know, and deck. Sure, all cool. All gas going on to And there's a great Geordie word which describes how you break something. And that word is napper. <laughs> <laughs> what we really want to know about all of this is how we're going to napper this system from. Okay. Um, all right. This requires a little bit more deep <coughs> systems knowledge. We need to figure out how the peer to peer stuff was working. And can we break that? Okay, it's one thing, get one addiction against a particular service. We want to know how do we knock down a whole peer to peer network of distributed video things? These boxes themselves are serving video streams to each other, as far as we can tell. There are one or two master servers, and then you know, the set top box that you've got on top of your TV may at the moment be the peer-to-peer -peer server for a particular channel. And this changes how we How do you go about breaking all these things? Well, what I hope you've worked out is a peer-to-peer -peer system is essentially the same architecture as Bob. Now, maybe we should teach you more about peer-to-peer -peer architectures. Maybe we should teach you more about distributed systems. Peer-to-peer, you know, -peer, botnet, as far as I'm concerned, they're the same thing. Um, there's a whole lot of literature out there about the performance of peer-to-peer -peer systems, actually how fragile they are in some sense, and how easy it is to disrupt their performance. Now, one of the things we thought was, well, if we can poison the control messages that are being chucked around between these peer-to-peer -peer servers, essentially, when your set-top box joins the peer-to-peer -peer network, it advertises itself and says, hey, I've got this 20 seconds of video for this channel. If you want it, ask me. And that advert is circulating around the place. And of course, if you imagine that happening by all of the set top boxes, then you end up with a collection saying, right, you need that 20 seconds from there, and the next 20 seconds from there, and the next 20 seconds from there, and in the background, it's buffering all of this stuff together. If we could figure out how those adverts saying, hi, I've got this 20 seconds for this channel, actually worked, then we can introduce completely duff messages into the network and with a bit of luck 
we can actually degrade the performance of it to the point of saying, well, right, okay, it's broken. Whether that constitutes an attack, whether that constitutes something we could legally do against a network which is actually mostly broadcasting legitimate traffic, it just happens to handle a bit of pirate stuff, is an interesting debate. We wouldn't do it. We would never launch that kind of attack. That's not our business. I've had some very interesting negotiations with the companies who want to do it, with the people they're subcontracted from. First thing I did was go along with the police and say, where would you, uh, how would you stand on this? Do you think this is something we can do? And they said, well, we can't, you do it. We can't do it. We're not allowed to do it because we're as bound by the Computer Misuse Act as they are. So they can't launch this kind of attack. Have you any idea who can? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, not enough. No. Uh, uh, turns out trading standards officers. <laughs> 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 Would you, you wouldn't believe how empowered trading standards officers are. I don't know if we've got anybody from trading standards in. I know I'm, I'm talking to some of the guys up in Vanessa about this. Yeah, no problem. That's, that's copyright protection, brand maintenance. We can do this. It's exactly the same as us launching a raid on various markets in Glasgow. We'd be perfectly happy to do it. Interesting. That had never occurred to me right at the beginning. How do we figure out these control messages? What am I doing for time? Let me finish very quickly. Um, well, we don't have the source for this thing. I thought maybe this is, you know, it's going to be somebody's just used a bit of open source software to do the peer-to-peer -peer video stuff. I don't think anybody's here who's involved in the Reset Student Project. Find as many open source peer-to-peer -peer video sharing bits of software as you can. Why is sharp with traffic? Does it look anything like this? No, okay, not that one. Um, we couldn't find one that it looked like, so we presume it's proprietary. Um, the binary is on an embedded platform. It's not as if this stuff's running on a PC. Uh, we don't even know what the processor is inside this damn thing. I dare say with a bit more grief we can, we can figure it out uh, a little bit more. We've got to reverse engineer an unknown peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Oh, God. <laughs> that's what we're faced with. There you are. That's, that's one of the things. You've got, you've got a bunch of wire shark stuff. We're wire sharking this thing. Where do you start? It is. How do you reverse engineer an unknown protocol? Well, it turns out that humans are very good at pattern recognition. Visually, would you stare at that, please, and tell me if you can see a giraffe? Stare hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Awful, guys. Um, it turns out that that basically is exactly what we did. We sat and stared at that for quite a long time. And suddenly you start seeing interesting things about it, like the repeat of 5C0900, 5C0900. After it, 43DDB05C. 43D5DD. Oh, hang on, there's some kind of pattern. And I'm doing in five seconds what I think it took me about three months to actually do is that we figured out that one word was a port number, the next four things is a dot and quad IP address. Uh, hang on, what we're actually looking at here is an advert saying this IP address on this port is serving this video channel and it's a collection of those in a table. Not nice, okay? But that's what we did just by kind of poking against that. Um, so the next thing I did was sit down and think, like, if I was designing their network, if I were them, how would I now make their network proof against what I can now do? Is that a useful thing to do? I don't know. It might come in. I, I can now design hardened peer-to-peer -peer networks if you want. Anybody's interested in how to design peer-to-peer -peer hardened networks? We've got some insight into that. Of course it's an arms race. One side tries to protect something, the other side tries to protect something. Lessons to be learned. All that staring was too much like hard work. It hurt my head. Um, I would like to get the computer to do it. And of course, I am 
what they thought of this, a software engineer. So I wrote a piece of software to do quickly, taking me three months to do by hand. The program automatically deduce and analyze the structure of unknown peer-to-peer -peer packets. Um, how do you do that? Very quickly. Well, a packet is just a string of bytes, for now. You could assume that it was structured like the top row there, where each byte was an individual bit of significant information. Or you could assume that it's five bytes followed by a two-byte thing. And you can work out all the possible structurings <coughs> that the message might have. There's my program running through doing some of the stuff. Uh, it's obviously decided the first two bytes are significant, they mean something followed by a one byte marker. It's trying all the different possible ways of structuring that message. So the question then is, how do you know which one of these structures is right? Anybody wants to work out how many possible different ways there are of structuring an n byte message, I would be very happy to have a bit of help with the theoretical uh, background of that side. Turns out we need to figure, on, figure out which one is right, or at least which one is useful in giving us some insight into what is going on. Well, you can take each one of those structurings, you can assign it some kind of score and sort them so we get more relevant ones. How do you figure out the score? Well, we're still working on this, is the answer. Uh, we need some scoring rules. You can help spell right in the slides. Uh, you might decide that a three-byte pattern which recurs all over the place is significant, so that gets a higher score than just a random three bytes. You might decide that a four-byte pattern with an increment between each one was worthy of some kind of score. So you come up with all kinds of daft scoring rules which uh, allow you to come up with a score for each of these structures. This is about as far as we've got. Okay? I've got something that can produce all the different structures. I've got an experimental set of rules which will tell me what it thinks is an interesting way of looking at the problem. <coughs> I don't know yet whether it's producing the right answers. I've been too busy teaching you lot for the past 12 weeks. Um, how do we do this kind of thing? Well, we do it by... We like rules, we like scores, we like weightings, we like permutations, mutations, relationships, structure, all the good computer science high-level stuff. Do we teach you that kind of high-level computer science stuff? Getting very encouraging. Um, for what it's worth, at the moment, very, very slow. It takes 30 minutes to do a 1K packet on the mighty EEPC 901 supercomputer on the desk in front of me. Um, we have faster technology available. Some of you will see me playing around with a PS3 cluster. Gavin will know a hell of a lot more than I do about GPU clustering, Amazon things. Um, Ethan is playing around GPU stuff. Building. So we do have an interest in how we parallelize this kind of thing to make it a bit faster. So even though it's slow at the minute, I'm all going to work. Final thoughts, I'll get off and let you have your lunch. Um, how do I do this? How do we do it? Uh, I'm going to say this myself, I'm on the cloud, we didn't make no claims to publish it. Through deep system publish. One thing I worry about, do we really teach you a lot sufficient about system level stuff? I think we we'll let you have a go with a little bit of it, nice programming, a little bit of scripting. I'm not sure that we teach you enough of kind of the deep, large scale system stuff. I would we'll be interested in your opinions on that. Well, I think the only reason I can do this is because when I did my degree and the stuff I've learned over the years since then is because I was taught for the fundamentals of computer science. Electronics, I'm damn sure we don't teach you enough about electronics. I know. I humbly suggest a bit about programming. I don't think we teach you lot enough about programming because that's what lets me do what I do. Um, we certainly don't teach you enough maths. I think we should. But then again, how the hell do we sell a degree which has got maths sitting in the syllabus? Would you lot come on ethical hacking if it had, had a maths module in the first year? Uh, lots of shaking heads. You see the problems I'm coming from. Um, Rory gave you lots of advice earlier on, I'm going to give you a bit. Never stop learning. When you leave here as a graduate, you know absolutely nothing. All we've taught you is how to learn. You've got lifetimes more to do. Uh, so what do academic security researchers do? We learn.